BMGM, everybody. Welcome to a new, updated, and a revamped version of the Web3 Futures podcast. Today, I am joined by Kevin, who is the CEO over at Uniblock. Today, we are going to be talking about some really cool things, uh, including unpacking what Uniblock is all about, to fundraising during the crypto winter, and on a more personal level, what life is like as an entrepreneur. Kevin, how you doing, man? Very good. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Well, it's been a while. Um, we've been trying to get this recording, you know, underway, but I'm I'm glad we finally made it, man. <laughs> we're here. We're here. And we're here. 2024. The bull run is upon us. Life is good. Yes, sir. So for those that don't know much about you and much about Uniblock, can you give us some sort of high level introduction? Yeah, for sure. So Kevin, nice to meet you. Um, I had a couple of startups. I sold a few of them, had some strikeouts, ended up at Twitter, uh, ended up at Coinbase. I am an angel investor. I've actually had my first exit. They IPO'd about a year and a half ago, which is great. Uh, I'm an LP in some funds and I teach product management on the side. Um, but really, primarily, my life is now 100% Uniblock. And Uniblock is something that we started working on a couple of years ago. Uh, with my co-founder, uh, we're trying to build a orchestration layer that sits on top of all the best developer tools. So what does that mean? Right now, if you're a developer, you likely need to go and stitch together, you know, five or six different tools um, and make sure that they work together, make sure that they don't break, make sure you're getting the right data. And, and that can be kind of really expensive, time consuming. Uh, and so um, what we do is we take care of all the guesswork. So you come on, you build on top of Uniblock, and you use one of our multi, uh, 30 or 40 different uh, partner integrations. We route the APIs, we um, do retries, we do fallbacks, uh, and you can uh, work just directly with us. So that's who I am, that's who we are, and excited to jump in. Yeah, man. So you're trying to make life easier for a lot of people, and, and, and you are, right? Um, what would you say the main problem that you're trying to solve is? Yeah. So right now, if you're a developer and you want to build something in web three, you're probably going and using, uh, multiple different solutions and, uh, those for your data, for your, everything from like RPC to even your smart contracts to your, um, listener on, on chain. So in order to do that, you're using probably, let's say, Morales, you're using QuickNode, you're using MoonPay, you're using ThirdWeb, you're using all these different tools and solutions. And so um, the uh, in, in Web2, we would potentially use something like an API orchestration layer that um, chooses where to get the data from, chooses you know how to do uh, retries, make sure that you're getting the right data at the right price every single time. And so that's that's where we step in. So uh, if you are building uh, these solutions directly, it takes a lot of time and money. And uh, we actually have a case study coming out right now where we save one of our customers about three months of dev work. We sold, save them about $200,000 worth of with our dev work. And then over the course of the project, we're saving them you know, hundreds if not thousands of dollars per month. And then we're saving them about 0.5 FTE, just keeping all those solutions together. So um, that's what we're trying to solve. Uh, and we have lots of happy customers using the product. That's really cool. And I think, you know, the, the bottom line and the bottom line for any company is very, it's essential, right? Um, because that's, you know, what's keeping the wheels running of the company and things like that. In terms of the challenges and building out what you've done, uh, what has been, would you say the main challenge? Yeah. I think there's lots of challenges, but from building the, so we're building a product, we're building a company and we're building an industry and it's all directly impacted by the macro environment. So from the product side, I think it's interesting because there really hasn't been anybody that's done this before. And so we're constantly thinking about new mental models. We're constantly thinking about how the product will manifest itself. We're thinking of the customer journey. And so that is interesting because Practically everywhere else that I've ever worked or where most people have worked, there are analogies that you can say, okay, well, let's say in my time at Twitter, frankly, you can look at other social networks from Facebook to uh, Reddit and say, okay, what's the paradigm? You know, how do they do this? How would they go about doing that? And you can tweak it and change 
but essentially there's other people who have done these things. Uh, but for Uniblock, there really isn't anybody. So it's very fascinating for us to have conversations because we're trying to do as much customer discovery and talking to our customers as possible. And we're trying to talk to all of our partner integrations as much as possible, understand how they're thinking about it. And the whole space is evolving so quickly. So it's a really interesting time to be building Uniblock because we're trying to figure things out that have not been figured out before. So that's really exciting. It can sometimes feel um, a little bit overwhelming, but we're able to attract incredible talent because we can say, hey, you know what? You're not gonna be a cog in the wheel. You're not gonna be doing something that people have been doing for the last 30 years. You're gonna be doing something that new and that attracts a certain uh, person to the company, which is exciting. I can totally understand that, especially if you're starting out like right at the beginning and you, you're doing something that you haven't really done before. And so, <laughs> Has there been any examples of you guys thinking that, you know, plan A is a best uh, method, right? And then you talk to some of the customers or potential clients and stuff and you're like, holy shit, we've gotten this whole thing wrong. You know, like, have there been times like that? Absolutely. So I think there's one thing that I like to, tr this mantra that I say within the company over and over and over again, which is if you're moving fast enough, everything that you've built six weeks ago is going to look woefully antiquated. So that's how fast we're moving that, you know, we built something and you're really proud of it. It can be your marketing, it can be your website, it can be parts of the product, it can be features, it can be emails, it could be how you're communicating to your customers, how you're communicating on podcasts. But when you're moving really quickly at this early stage, um, it starts to, you look back two months and you're like, wow, that looks really old and silly. And I can't believe that's how we thought about things. So I think actually the way I would, I would think about it is more that the evolution and the trajectory of the company is so fast that everything kind of feels a little silly from, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, you know, when we started, we tried to communicate our value by saying, oh, we're effectively, you know, APIs. And people were like, well, there's lots of APIs. Like, what does that mean? And how are you any different than these other companies? And we would say, well, no, we're not competing with them. We're partnering with them. But that also didn't necessarily translate into customers understanding the value. And then we started talking about ourselves as a unified API, which, again, doesn't really um, have a mental model for people building. They're like, OK, I don't really know what that is. Sounds cool. And it might just be, again, APIs that you are you know, building yourself. <clears throat> and you know, we would have the logos of our integration partners. We're trying to add the value. And now we're starting to try to explain we're a unified API. Or an orchestration layer, and an orchestration layer actually is something that people grok onto because it's a paradigm that we have in Web two. So um, and yeah, so essentially, it's like we're trying to explain. So no, actually, we're not necessarily APIs. We're the orchestration layer on top of the APIs, routing them and making sure that they work. And the product has been the same, but the way we communicate it is different. And there are a couple of mental model changes for us. So do we put the integration partner first in a flow and say, okay, you want to choose one of the partners and then at the end you get the data or do we want to say the data first and then you, you know, you want wallet data or you're building a wallet and then we choose which integration partner. So yes, there's lots of times you look back and think, well, that was silly. We do it practically every day because things are moving so quickly. And uh, I think we kind of embrace that and, and just continue to move forward. That's really interesting, you know. There's no easy path forward, right? And I think with any kind of project, when you're starting out, there's a lot of different strategies that you have to implement. Um, in terms of your go-to-market, what did that look like? Yeah. So I think uh, there's a couple of things to think about us versus companies that were able to raise hundreds, if not billions of dollars during the the, net, the last boom cycle, not only in crypto, but in tech. So for us, we don't have tens of millions of dollars for marketing. So, you know, unfortunately, we're not able to sponsor booths at um, uh, your conferences. We're not able to sponsor websites. We don't have the money to sponsor podcasts. And so there's a lot of things that unfortunately our go to market has to be different. And I think that's good. So yeah, if you came to me, Stephen, and said, hey, here's like $10 million, that'd be great. And you can only use it in marketing. Awesome. Let's do it. But the reality is we just have to do things a little bit differently. So think of us as 
uh, engineering led. So um, we're very much product people, pretty much everybody on the company is an engineer. Um, and so where we can uh, interact with like, for example, your listeners, where we can interact with other partners, we do. So what we can do is co-marketing. So the integration partners, many of them have raised tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars, are able to help you know, explain and, and market us to some of their users. Um, we're able to do things like this, talk to the community where it's really our time. So we have lots of time, we don't have any money. So we do uh, a lot of this is try to communicate our value uh, as much as possible. Uh, we're constantly working with other communities. So let's say you are a protocol layer and you want more developers on your space building in your, in your ecosystem. Uniblock's a great way to do that because now all of a sudden you have thousands of de developers that have access to all the different tools that your space has. And one problem that we're solving that I should have brought up was the discoverability issue. So a lot of people, a lot of devs don't have the, um, the knowledge of, okay, what are the 45 different tools that are in all these ecosystems? So we create that discoverability layer. But those are the go-to-market that we, we can control. Uh, and we also see a lot of customers that come in, they like the product and they bring in their team, they bring in other teams. So I think that viral nature is probably one of our strongest go-to-market. And I think what also is important is having a product that actually works, right? Um, because I think in terms of <laughs> you know, like partnerships and stuff, you, you see a lot of them on the likes of Twitter or X and there's partnerships going on every day, all these different announcements and things like that. But when you look at what these partnerships are actually offering, there's not much from what I've seen, right? So how do you manage to establish these like strategic partnerships? Um, is it some sort of like BD process that you guys, you know, go through or is every case different? Yeah, you know, you raise a great point that there is a lot of noise and I get it. Like people are trying to create some sort of excitement, particularly when, um, you know, things were tough for the last call it 18 months. And I think that we've done the opposite. So again, uh, if you look at, the people on our team versus people on other people's teams, everybody is um, right working on the product. So uh, we're very much, like I said, product and engineering led. And so partnerships are um, based on a couple of different buckets. One is our integration partners. So these are people that have built um, world-class tools and we're looking for ways to kind of bring them into the ecosystem so that uh, a developer can, you know, route some of their uh, requests to their uh, to that provider. And so there's, like I said, we have um, dozens of those and we'll continue to to add more. And when we get, you know, a deep partnership with them, though, you'll see it kind of through the X Twitters of the world and, you know, various other PR. Then we've got kind of a layer up. We have companies that are kind of in a similar situation to us where Maybe they've raised a little bit of money. They're really great people. They're trying to do something really interesting in the space. And I think all of us need to kind of band together. So if people are, um, you know, trying to build something to bring the space forward, I think it, you know, it behooves all of us to work together to do that. And so, you know, in my travels, we get to meet some really awesome founders, some really great people building. And, uh, you know, we're actually going to do a spaces with one of them coming up like next week. Um, and we're trying to just help each other out. Then you've got the customer level. So one level up. So those are people that are kind of sitting on top of Uniblock and, and leveraging our technology to speed themselves up and lower their costs. And so for those, those people, um, absolutely. We're always looking to do case studies. Uh, we're always trying to talk to, you know, our VCs and our, um, our, uh, funding partners to say, Hey, we're, we've got some really cool people building some interesting things. Why don't you take a look at this? Um, and so there's lots of different things for our customers that we lean in and do. Um, and so those are kind of the three layers that I would, I would look at when we talk about partnerships. Oh, um, <laughs> so in terms, yeah, both, of, yeah. in terms of fundraising, we've skimmed over that topic, but I want to get a bit deeper into, you know, the successes of Uniblock. 
And I saw that you guys had raised over $2 million during the crypto winter, which is something that is a big achievement. How did you guys do that? We did it with a lot of hard work. We did it with um, really great partners. Uh, we did it with an amazing team. So none of this would have been possible without our team. And frankly, I want to, you know, I hope some of them listen to this and watch this because I have the most utmost respect for them. Biggest hat tip. Um, you know, we were um, pretty much self-funded for many, many months. And it got to the point where, you know, FTX blew up, um, SVB blew up, Celsius blew up, BlockFi blew up, uh, Three Arrows Capital blew up. Everything was blowing up. And, you know, every single one of them stuck around. And they were all getting paid almost nothing, essentially minimum wage. And these people are all, uh, you know, based in North America. They've gone to the best colleges, and universities. They can go work at Google and every single one of them stayed with us. And there was a couple of conversations where they said, Hey, like this other company is offering me whatever twice as much as you, you know, I'm getting here, but I really like staying here. Are like, are we okay? And, and I said, yes, like I, you know, we're in a good spot. Um, here's the honest truth. Here's where we're at. And so I have a lot of respect for every single person on the team because every single one of them could have gone and, work somewhere else. And I know for a fact that many of them did get offers to go to uh, uh, Binance or Coinbase, but they all stuck around. So thank you team. If you watch this, really appreciate all of you. Then the other one is our um, uh, funding partners. So all the investors. So I am extremely fortunate to have been in the space here in the Valley for a number of years. And so I've met my fair share of uh, VCs. I'm an LP in some funds and uh, just people that have gone and you know done amazing things. And so two things happened. One was probably about five to 10 different angels, like really good friends of mine came and said, hey, you're starting something. I'd like to give you some money. I don't know what you're doing, but I, I like you. And I said, thank you. I really like you, but I'm not gonna take your money. Let me go and raise at least a million dollars of uh, VC capital, because I value our friendship more than the money that you can provide. Although please make intros, I'd appreciate that. And um, I, you know, this is kind of the opposite of what you learn in business school. And it's really case by case, not every founder um, will have this point of view, and I totally respect it. But for me, I would not be able to sleep at night and be as effective if I was worried about my, you know, five or 10 closest friends and the money that they've given me. Um, so uh, when we did hit the 1 million, then they all came in uh, at the same valuation. We, we made everybody whole. But um, yeah, it was very important to me to, to keep these friends close and make sure that people know that, you know, I'm trying to think of their best interests as much as possible. But then uh, some really amazing uh, VCs. So um, Honestly, the, the the side door venture people they came in really early with a, with a check that really changed their trajectory. Um, Blockchain Founders Fund came in. Shout out to all those guys. They came in early and really helped um, do a lot of uh, a good there. Shout out to Cadenza. They came in too. So um, there's just a ton of people that um, bet on us early and did kind of the counter. So at that time, it was like crypto's dead. Um, just pack your bags, go to AI. And we heard a lot of that. I had 69 VC calls before we got our first yes. And now, you know, my pitch got better. Our product got better. The world stopped, kind of almost stopped blowing up. But, you know, that's how much it takes. And so I, I, I have a lot of respect for early backers. I will always remember them. And, you know, whatever way I can like help them out, we will, but people stepped in and, um, and came in and, and helped early on. And then the last thing is the grit. So it's something that I will tell a lot of VC or sorry, entrepreneurs, uh, that, you know, you get these stories, uh, of fundraising three years ago and money was just like dropping from the sky. You know, you got to talk to five VCs, you get five different term sheets. And uh, that's just not the case. And I think people need to change the way they view the world. And it's a world where the money is there, 
but you have to work 10 times harder. So if I had 69 calls to get the first yes, and then I had, you know, 150 calls to kind of close the round, um, you know, maybe it would have been 15 last, uh, you know, in 2021. So um, what does that mean? It means that you have to keep your mental state in a good spot because no investor wants to invest in somebody that's, you know, not projecting the opportunity. Uh, it means you got to have to keep your, your team kind of running. You have to keep everything going. You have to learn. You have to get better each time. And you have to deal with a lot of heartache, really. You know, hearing, you don't even hear no because people just, just like stop responding. They just ghost you. So, but hearing no 69 times is crappy for anybody. Even if you've got like unlimited energy, it's not a great feeling. And so just know going into that, that that's the environment we're in. Everything you're reading on Reddit or YC, like from 2021 is pretty much irrelevant. Um, so just understand that the environment you're in is kind of back to where we were in call it 2015 and, and just like go, go at it and make sure that you're pushing everything forward. Um, and understand that your team is extremely important. The investors are extremely important and, and grit is, is very important. That's crazy. And there's no doubt that resilience is, you know, one of the, one of those characteristics that you must have. Right. And it, it, it's showing through this call. I want to ask you, because there's no doubt also that you would have met a lot of other founders in the space. Right. So besides from, let's say grit and resilience, are there any other, let's say common characteristics of founders um, that you've picked up on? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I have a little bit of a counter view of all of this that people talk about intelligence and I think that's overrated. I think EQ is extremely important and IQ is, you know, to be honest with you, everybody you meet is probably smart enough to be an entrepreneur. You don't necessarily have to be that smart. <laughs> And I think that, you know, we meet these people and we say, oh, IQ is so smart, whatever. But I think EQ is extremely important. So being able to connect with uh, your customers, being able to connect with your team, being able to like read the, the room, um, I think is very, very important. And so, yeah, I think, I think probably something that I see is the people that are able to, um, you know, connect with everybody and you know navigate the room is i think very valuable other than that um again if we're really really honest with ourselves most startups are not like super cutting edge a lot of people are not you know shooting up rockets and making them you know reusable or you know saving the penguins uh in the north pole i think a lot of it is um just doing it right like people are always looking for that amazing idea or they're thinking about like you know how do i make sure nobody copies my idea but if you if you really look at the vast majority of startups let's say the lot like over the last 10 years a lot of them are kind of same themes they're kind of doing similar things like it's not a lot of like new in general and so you just got to kind of go and so for me there was three things for us to go. One was a space that I was willing to get my ass kicked for, you know, five to 10 years, something I'm that passionate about. And so that is what we're building. Uh, a team that I was willing to get my ass kicked with, uh, leading the pack. And so that came to fruition with the founders and team. And, you know, being in a, a position mentally and financially with my family where you can kind of go and say, okay, well, I'm not gonna go work at Google and get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars with free lunch and, you know, my back, my free backpack and my free Patagonia vest, I'm going to go and do this thing. And so those three things kind of came together uh, with Uniblock and the team and the timing. And it's never going to be perfect, right? Like my wife generally is like, you're nuts. Like, you know, Hey, <laughs> we'd like to actually, you know, retire at some point or would like to buy a car at some point or whatever. 
uh, would like to not be looking over our shoulder, worrying about paying the mortgage or whatever. So you're never going to have all three, but those were the things that were important to me when we kind of went on this journey and so far so good. That's amazing to hear, man. And you've spoken a lot about your team as well, you know, um, and I think that's a sign of a very good leader, you know, when he backs his team and having his team trust him as well. So I want to ask you the question of how do you foster a culture of like innovation uh, within your company? You know, like with work from home being a thing now, uh, with COVID a couple years ago, a lot of talks about work-life balance, you know, like how do you find that perfect balance for your team? Yeah, I think it's an iterative process. Mm. So you asked two, a couple of different questions, so I'll try to impact them a little bit. Like one of them is how do you kind of inspire your team and how do you empower your team and how do you create innovation and that type of mindset? I think there's a couple of things. One is that we try to hire the absolute, and it's not even hire, we try to attract the absolute best people who could literally go and work at shit sending rockets to space or saving the penguins so how do we attract those people and i think that's one of our superpowers um you know we teach the colleges universities um we try to be really deep in the community and so um attract and retain we've never really i don't think we've ever had anybody leave the company um and so that's important so you want that that type of um, person who is is drawn towards this because I'm going to tell you, man. I don't know if you've had lunch at Google, but they've got really good food and their vests, A plus backpacks, awesome. And you know, uh, so really, it's you're okay. Do you want to work at an amazing company that is a great brand with amazing food? Totally understand that, and I did that, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Or would you like to work at a company where um, we're all trying to build something that's never been built before and everything you do is going to matter a lot? And so it's almost this bifurcation. It's this like forcing function for people to say like, yes, this is what I want to do. And we, again, we've had people that have turned down Google jobs. We've had people that have turned down Binance jobs. They've come and work for us. I think the other thing is when they get here, we have really huge milestones and goals that we're going towards. And so um you know there when you tell a really driven person this huge mission and kind of like this general path like okay we know we got to get from a to z um but we don't really know exactly the order of the letters or you know how we're going to do it um and we're all going to kind of come together i think that helps people to think outside the box and think 10x and think about like how to make an impact uh, rather than, um, you know, sitting back and like hoping other people will do that for them. So I think attracting the right people uh, and retaining them. And I think like giving them big meaty goals and working together, I think is another one. And so so that's kind of like us in a nutshell. Um, and then again, like trying to be transparent, trying to be like, um, you know, empowering people, getting people excited. Uh, you know, that's kind of where we're at. And we have a lot of fun doing it. Honestly, I actually really enjoy coming to work. Um, and that's a lot of fun. You asked another question around tools and work from home and things like that. And I, I think that's a very iterative process as well. I don't think any company or any leader can definitively say the right tool stack, the right way to do things yet. I think there will be a lot of case studies, a lot of HBR case studies are written in the future about what the best way to do, you know, a workforce post COVID-19 is. Um, my sense is there's pros and cons to both being in an office. Actually, I think all three, 100% being in office, kind of like 2018 styles. Some sort of hybrid, which frankly, like hybrid could be you come in once a month or like three times a week. There isn't really a consensus around what hybrid is, frankly. And also like, do you have to be in a certain country? Do you have to be in a certain time zone? So like hybrid is this huge bubble that I don't think we, I think that's where we're all kind of playing. And then there's this like completely remote, 100% will never see you. And I think the two extremes are probably uh, 
are probably not what 90% of companies are going to do. I think most people are not going to say in our industry anyway, yes, you have to be in the office five days a week, you know, 12 months of the year, probably not realistic. And we're seeing in the numbers when you look at um, uh, office space and things like that. And then completely remote, there always was companies that kind of did this, but like, I, I think generally when I talk to even the most like, on that uh, side of hybrid, generally they're trying to get together at least once a quarter or something like that um, to, to create that togetherness. And I think that togetherness is really important. So um, I've worked at companies that were fully remote and I don't feel like I have the same connection with the team. Um, I, I think there's this human nature element where if you actually spend time you build this um, trust, you build all this like uh, capital together so that when I say, Stephen, I need a favor or I don't understand something or can, you know, I can help you. There's that trust, that human trust. And so I think that if you're for us, I'll tell you what we're trying to do. We are trying to say you, we, you know, you come in at least once a month, <laughs> once a month, we'll do it all hands. And it'll be great. And everybody comes together. Uh, we spend the whole day together and there's a presentation, there's lunch. Uh, we, we go for drinks afterwards. Um, so that's like our monthly kind of thing. And that actually happens on this Friday, the end of the month. And then we try to do some, um, we, we're trying to do some games or something throughout the month that's either in person or virtual. And the other offer is if you want to go to a WeWork, uh, we will pay for your uh, membership and come in once a week. So that's what we're doing. Uh, and of the company, we have about four people that have taken us up on the outcomes that we work at least once a week. But I would say well, the whole company comes to our, our, our all hands once a month. So that's us always trying to learn uh, and always trying to get better. So there's a lot of things that we've spoken about, right? And I to wrap these big topics up, I have one question and that is what you've learned being a entrepreneur and being a CEO um, along the way, you know, what is one thing that you wished you knew prior to taking up this journey of um, building out Uniblock? What is one thing I wish I knew? I think I wish I knew the amount of stress that I would be putting my significant un other under. I think I always sort of knew without knowing. And so, because now she is the breadwinner and she is required to do other things, like walk the dogs when I'm on a podcast. I don't know if you can hear them in the background screaming or, you know, take care of things when I'm, you know, putting everything I've got into this, as well as the uncertainty. Like, are we going to raise this round? Are we going to be able to raise the next round? Is this customer going to sign up? And so I think there's this dynamic, at least in our relationship, where this is somewhat new to her, where I like, generally throughout my life had fairly well-paying jobs where I got the backpack and the Patagonia vest with the lunch and now I don't and it's been a little bit of a impact on her that I was I'm not saying I hadn't thought of it but I wasn't fully aware to you're in the middle of it so that's probably the one thing when I said I had those three pieces sorted which is like team and position and then like you know financially and mentally being ready I think I overestimated how ready we were for entrepreneurship and underestimated the load that I was putting on her shoulders. Um, so yes, that's probably one thing that I probably should have told myself. Although then I don't know if we'd be here. So maybe we'll, uh, I guess, luckily we won't be able to figure out what would have happened. <laughs> yeah. I think when it comes to taking these big risks, you don't know what you don't know, right? Like you can prepare yourself for these things mentally, but when shit hits the fan, it's a different story when it's happening in real time, right? <laughs>
Absolutely. Mm. So you did mention, you know, raising and funding as well. The crypto markets are doing pretty well compared to, let's say, the likes of last year. How confident are you in terms of raising and where do you see the market going in the next year? I'm 100% confident in raising. We're going to absolutely crush it. And I think part of that is based on uh, everything I said. Our team's amazing. Our traction is great. Our integration partners are awesome. And our customers are, are really seeing value. And we love our customers. So um, I think absolutely without a doubt, it depends on when, um, not if. And, and I'm really excited about that. Yeah, and I'm very, I'm very bullish on the market. So, you know, my tweets are out there. You can see when I was, when I kind of turned bullish, which was about a year ago, actually a year and a bit ago. Um, so that would be what, November, December, 2022. I started to say, hey, like all the shoes have dropped, not necessarily just in uh, crypto, but also just macro in general. Um, all the shoes have dropped. It feels like we are kind of bottoming out. Um, I'm pretty bullish on what's happening. And so I think we've got a, a lot of the headwinds are now becoming tailwinds. And, uh, you know, we're going to probably see rates coming down. We're probably going to see inflation around the world come down. We're pro it's a U.S. election year. We're definitely going to see more spending, which is a crazy because we're at unprecedented levels. Um, obviously, the halving in Bitcoin's coming up. So I think the macro environment is very good. And I think that just our particular space is very good because um, the the risk assets like uh, like crypto are generally impacted by the flow and just by the, the macro uh, world. So I'm very bullish on the space and very, very bullish on what we're building. Kevin, to wrap things up, what's happening over at Uniblock? What's the, yeah, what's happening over at Uniblock? Uh, what can the listeners and the people watching this be excited for? Can you give us any alpha? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So first off, um, please connect with us. We're on obviously Discord, we're on Twitter. Uh, you can sign up for free. The product is free. Uh, so you get all these tools and what we end up doing is we uh, negotiate better pricing from the partners and we take a percentage of the savings. So you actually uh, get paid to use Uniblock uh, and you can get a hold of us anywhere. Um, I'm pretty excited. So we have a lot of really great products coming out. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're the one-stop shop so you can get access to all the different data uh, across everything. We So we have um, non-EVM coming out. We have a lot of different features coming out that will make the developer journey easier. We have some ease of use product uh, enhancements so that you know we've had people come through the product and said, hey, it'd be great if I could choose this or I could do that. So we're, we think that some minor changes on our end will really increase the developer experience. But uh, we ship really quickly. We ship features every single week. Um, and so, yeah, that whole adage around six weeks ago, uh, work looks antiquated, we're moving that quickly. Um, so it's pretty exciting. That is for sure very exciting, man. So any last, uh, any last things you want to say to the listeners, man? Yeah, I mean, I think, so crypto is global. It's amazing to have kind of a global audience. Our users are around the world. We're in something like 70 different countries. Um, and so I'm really excited to, uh, I, you know, speak or speak to your listeners uh, and see kind of what they see in their part of the world. Uh, I was at Token 2049 and it was just incredible just to see the electricity, see people building things. It felt really great and it feels like um, that part of the world was like six months to a year ahead of, uh, of North America. So super excited to be here because I think that I think that some really great entrepreneurs are in that side of the planet. And so if you ever want to connect, I'd love to be able to connect with you and just see what you're seeing and help you build your, your project. Yeah, man. Well, there's a lot of events uh, later this year. We got one in Denver, we got a token in London, some events in Dubai. So I'm sure we'll cross, cross paths sometime this year. Let's do it. I love it.
Well, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. I hope you listeners enjoyed this amazing episode with Kevin from Unibot. And we shall see you all on the next one. Take care, guys.